This is mini lecture number 10, covering night 4.4 and some of 4.6 as well. So the idea here in night 4.4 is that you have some track that's round, and the track has radius r. And whatever particle you're considering in the problem is stuck to the track. So it might be here on the track, or it might be over here on the track, or it might be over there on the track, but it's on this track that has radius r. And if some particle is stuck to a track at radius r, that means we can say exactly where the particle is just by specifying one number. And the one number we have to specify is that angle. And if you specify that angle, you know how far this way it is, that would be uh, r cos theta, and you know how far that way it is, that would be r sine theta. So you know everything about this particle if you know its theta value. So far so good. The next thing we do is we decide that we're going to measure theta in radians. And that turns out to be extremely convenient. If we measure theta in radians, and there are two pi radians in a circle, then if the particle goes all the way around once, that means that it's gone to, the angle theta has gone from zero to two pi. And the circumference of a circle is two pi r. So if we measure angles and radians and the angle changes by an amount delta theta, then the actual distance that the particle travels is r delta theta. That's how far it goes along the rim. Let's say I go from there to there, then this one might be my delta theta, and that distance right there would be r delta theta. And this only works if you measure angle in radians. Okay, so far so good. The next thing we're gonna do is the usual bunch of stuff. We're going to introduce angular velocity, and we're going to introduce angular acceleration. First, we introduce the average velocity. But if we wanted to talk about the average rate of change of angle, we would say, oh, the angle changed by amount delta theta. And it did that in a time delta t. And we could call that omega sub abg. The average angular velocity. And if we took the limit that delta t goes to zero, so that we're looking at the angular velocity over an extremely short period of time, this would just be d theta dt. Okay, so this thing here is known as the angular velocity. And its definition is that it's d theta dt. So uh, something that has a high angular velocity would be going around very quickly. And something that has a low angular velocity would be going around slowly. It's just a measure of how fast theta is changing. And again, the units we usually, almost always use for this stuff are radians. Okay, so the next thing we can do, we can define angular acceleration. Maybe something is going around slowly for a while, or maybe it's picking up speed and going around faster and faster. That would be represent a changing omega. That would represent that omega itself, not just the angle, but omega itself were changing. So we can define that. We can ask, how much does the angular velocity change over some amount of time. So that would be delta omega in some delta t. And we can call that the angular acceleration. And as usual, we start by defining at first its average value. And then we imagine taking the limit that t goes to 0, delta t goes to 0 of that, and now that gives us d omega dt. 
Okay, so I've defined angular velocity from night 44, and I've defined angular acceleration from night 46. Now I'm not going to do anything more on night 45 and night 46 in this flipped lecture. I'm going back and I'm going to finish off night 44. In night 44, there's some other things that we could define. If something has a constant angular velocity, omega, well, that means that in a time t, it's going through an angle, omega t. And if we set the time t, that angle that it goes in time t, to be equal a full 2 pi, we can find out how long it takes to go around once. And the, the special time symbol that we use for the time to go exactly around once is capital T. So here we've just learned that omega, capital T, is equal to 2 pi. That's the time to go around once, and it's called the period. And we can solve it. We can solve it. We can say uh, omega is equal to 2 pi over t. Or we can also say t is equal to 2 pi over omega. So a very short period results in a high angular velocity, or a very long period results in a low angular velocity. Okay, now there's one more symbol that is extremely commonly introduced in angular motion, and that's f. f is what we call the frequency, and that is 1 over the time to go around once. So if it takes uh, 3 seconds to go around once, then that's one third. If it takes 0.1 seconds to go around once, that's 10. And what are the units? I gotta be a little more precise here. Let's give an example. If it takes three seconds to go around once, then F is equal to, the frequency, is once in three seconds. One over three seconds, which is equal to one third of once per second. And the units per second is so common, it has a name, and we call it the Hertz. And we abbreviate it capital H little z. And if something takes, say, maybe 0 0.000001, that's one, two, three, four, five zeros and then a one of a second to happen once, then the frequency f is equal to 1 over 0 0.000001 seconds. Okay? And 1 over 0 0.000001, well, it, you could figure out how to do this. If there were only, if this was only 0 0.1, that would be 10. If it was 0 0.01, that would be 100. If it was 0 0.001, that would be 1,000. If it was 0 0.0001, that would be 10,000. If it was 0 0.00001, that would be 100,000. But if it's 0 0.000001, that's equal to 1 million. Hertz. And the way we usually say that is if something goes takes 10 to the minus 6 seconds, then it's happening at 10 to the 6 Hertz. Okay, so I've introduced uh, frequency, angular frequency, period. Uh, there's one other formula you can get from the two that I've already got, got there, which is that the angular frequency, omega, is 2 pi f. And you can get that by saying that f is 1 over t, but also omega was 2 pi over t. And from those two, you get this. Okay. That's reading lecture 10.